The problem is this speaker right up I was this far away from it yesterday afternoon. I think, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Don. I have a question for you. How many of you were in World War II in the Pacific? Very interesting. Usually we don't get very many. A lot of people know about Europe, but not too many people know about the Pacific. I hope I can explain a few things to you. First of all, I want to acknowledge uh, a few gentlemen who did a great deal to help me for this presentation. Uh, George Hinckley, and he was here this afternoon, I'm not sure he's here tonight. Uh, John Horan, Bob Johnston, and Bob and Bonnie Dalzell, who Don has already mentioned we lost last month, and he was a great help. They, they invited me to their home and helped me go through this and get me to remember what happened 56, 57 years ago. And I found that was quite an, or an ordeal. To remember dates and so forth got to be quite a challenge. Um, to, to start, I'm going to just give you a brief rundown of what I did. Most of my, what I have to say here is personal experience. Um, I hope I won't ramble on. I tried not to, but uh, I got lost once in my presentation here this afternoon. I'll try not to do that again today. Um, I enlisted, uh, as lots of crazy young men do, uh, in 1943, November. Uh, I just, I was 18. Uh, I came, uh, came home and told my parents what I'd done, and they were all horrified. But my brother was with the 34th Division as an enlistee in, in, in Africa, in Italy, and my father joined the French Army during World War I, so they couldn't say too much to me. My mother was horrified, but I, uh, boy, this thing didn't work very well. I uh, was told to pack my gear and show up at Fort Dix, New Jersey, the first week in January 1943, and so off I went. And I was in Dix for about uh, three days where they measured me for all sorts of equipment, gave me tests and find out what my abilities were, and uh, put me on a troop train, sent me to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, where I spent three days sitting on a wicker-seated, old wicker-seated coach. Boy, after you've been on one of those things for three days, you're in tough, you're in tough shape. Uh, when we got on the train, it goes on and off, Don. I don't know what it is. It's still on the... I don't... Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, we were met by one of the biggest human beings I've ever met in my life. He was six feet six. His name was Sergeant Peeker. And this guy was so big, he couldn't wear a standard helmet on his head. He had to take the liner out of his helmet, and then the steel helmet would just fit on his head. <laughs> this guy could bellow like a bull. You could hear him for two miles away. He was our drill sergeant for 13 weeks. And he was as tough as they come, but he was also very fair. He was a good, good man. We started out training on 105 millimeter howitzers, and somehow or other the Fort Dix test, test caught up with me, and they decided I could be a radio operator. So I was moved over to the radio operator school and turned to trained to be an operator in uh, artillery, and uh, that was where I took most of my training. When we were finished there, uh, they couldn't think of anything to do with this for the days following, right after we'd finished training. So they gave us pickaxes and started us digging up the battery street in front of the front of the battery offices. This was macadam. We dug up the macadam, put it in, a wheel, put it in wheelbarrows, took it all the way to the end of the battery street, dumped it on a big steel plate that had a fire underneath it. It softened it all up, then we put it back in the wheelbarrow and take it back down and put it down again. That's what we were doing. This lasted for one week, and we were down there digging away, and we looked up, and here's this spiffy-looking guy standing on the corner, all dressed up in jump boots and paratrooper outfit and all the rest of this stuff. And just, anybody want to join the 101st Airborne? 
And this guy, Nicholson, and I said, we'll join any damn thing. Where do you want us to go? He said, come with me. So we go over to the battery office. And who's there? Sergeant Peeker. He's managing, he's managing the office while he's waiting for a new group to come in to train. And the kid who was a poor corporal, he said, Sergeant, these two young men want to volunteer for the 101st Airborne. Will you cut their orders and let them go? And he looks at him and says, listen, sonny boy, those two buffoons are going to Fort Sill the day after tomorrow, and that's where they're going to go. Now get out of here. <laughs> so that's how close we came to getting to the 101st Airborne, which went, of course, land in Normandy. Two days later, uh, true to his word, we were put on a troop, troop train and sent to uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma, where we were supposed to be trained for 10 weeks as radio mechanics. At the end of the 10th day, we were told to pack our gear. Guy came in and said, pack your gear, you're moving out. And we all said, well, we're supposed to be here for 10 weeks. Pack your gear, you're moving out. So we got on a troop train, went to Fort Ord, California, and we arrived there and it was nothing but fog. You couldn't see anything. And we were on the, right in the Fort Orders in the San Francisco area. And all we could hear was uh, sea lions down on the, in the bushes somewhere barking. So we started on these 10 mile conditioning hikes. Boy, these things were loaded, loaded pack in sand. So we did this for four days and then all of a sudden they said, pack your gear fellows, pack your gear, it's dark. We walk down this long, long train, get on a, uh, an automobile car ferry, like an old, regular car, old car ferry, pack us on, and take us to this uh, big uh, transport. And they open a the door on the side of the transport, and they put a, a, a board across, and they just walk into this darn ship, and signed us to bunks up in the forward end of the thing, and said, now you guys stay below zero, below here until we get, get, get going. They shut the door and the whole, the whole boat was loaded, except for us. They were waiting for us. So they take off and it's dark and we go under the, uh, the Golden Gate Bridge. And the thing that I remember about it was they allowed us to come up on deck, no smoking, no smoking at all, no lights at all. But the thing that was interesting was the whole of San Francisco was blacked out. And I don't, people didn't realize this, that the Japanese were so damn close that they were worried. So the only lights we saw were a few cars going across the top of the Golden, Cross, Golden Bridge, Golden Gate Bridge, and uh, we went to sea. And uh, this was a big ship. Uh, it must have been a, it was a, it was a, a, uh, a cruise ship or something like that at one time because there were three decks above on top with state rooms and all that sort of stuff on it. And that's where the officers and the uh, nurses or were, the replacement officer nurses were kept, and we were all down in the hold. Our bunks, we were up forward, and there must have been, I'm gonna say, two or three hundred of us in the forward area. And we had bunks, pipe bunks, pipe rack bunks, six tiers high. And when you're climbing at the top, you'd step up and you'd step in a guy's face, and the next time you'd step on somebody's arm. And I, lucky a guy, I'm, I'm the sixth, sixth tier up. And boy, I really, I was really upset about that. Until we started to get into where it was warm and I found that there was a big ventilator above me. And I was the one guy that got nice fresh air during the whole trip and everybody else down below <laughs> was 120 degrees. One other thing I remember, well, two other things I remember about this, this ship. Uh, as you always do, you get, uh, your yard bird, you, you, you draw guard duty. And my post was up on the first deck uh, underneath a ventilator that came up out of the galley. And you'd stand there for four hours and all this baking bread smell and cooking this and everything would be blown out on top of you. would stand there and salivate for the, for the whole time. And then you'd look up and here would be these officers and nurses standing up on at the rail looking down at us peasants down there. And I always remember the great uh, cartoon from Bill Morland. And it showed these two officers standing up on this hill, big, big shots, you know, standing up on this hill. And they're looking out over this beautiful valley. And one guy says to the other, he says, my, he says, this is a beautiful view. And this is such a beautiful spot. He says, is there one for the enlisted men? <laughs> and I said to myself, boy, this is what we're saying. 
The other thing I remember, and I saw, I've got to tell you this, but it's not, a, not pleasant. In the forward end of this thing, when I say we had about 300 guys, uh, they had a latrine. And a latrine, for those of you who don't know, is a, is a bathroom, a toity, where you do your duty. And this was made of a big trough, which was about, oh, I don't know, from here to the wall, long, across the ship. And there were two planks set on it, and you sat on it, and you did what you had to do. And underneath there was a big pipe, about this big around, blasting salt water through this trough, and it ran all the way down the trough, and then out the other end. And so everything would get cleaned out. This was fine until the ship started to roll. <laughs> and the ship would roll, and this water would go all the way down on one end, and you'd start this giant, giant cascade coming down the other one. And if you were sitting on that thing, you were in real trouble, let me tell you. And I don't think anybody else on that ship will forget it, because it was so, so uh, Well, we, it took us uh, 14 days to get to uh, Pearl Harbor. We had one destroyer with us, and we had to zigzag all over the place to keep away from the Japanese. And uh, we arrived there, and uh, this was in uh, June of 44, and even then, uh, you could see the signs of the, the Japanese bombing. There were ships, still hulks of ships in the harbor, and you could see the mast sticking up and so forth. It was a real, real mess. We didn't, we didn't anchor. Uh, we didn't go in and, and tie up. We anchored out in the harbor, and uh, within an hour, they had uh, the lighters, big flat bottom, flat top lighters come out, and they unloaded a whole bunch of us. I mean, some, there must have been 300 of us onto these lighters. We climbed down uh, these big uh, rope nets down the side of the ship and onto the lighters. And then they took us over the other side of the bay and put us on a what they called an AKA. This was a, an attack transport. And uh, put us in, locked us up, and they were waiting for us there again. The whole ship was full of people except for us. When we got on there, they slammed the thing shut, started up, and took off. We took off in the dark, and it took us uh, I think 12 days to get to New Guinea. And when we got out of harbor, they said, you boys are going as replacements to New Guinea. And so uh, we uh, had, uh, had the start, and we were about to do it. Now, what I want to do is just d move off a little bit here and go back and recount a few things uh, about the Pacific Theater. Uh, most of us, uh, me, I know, when you went to grammar school or whatever it was, uh, you went to a class in geography. And they had a book when they opened the book. And before long, we all knew where England was. We all knew where Germany was. And we all knew where Italy was. It looked like a boot. And we knew where Ger Russia was. <coughs> then you started to ask people about what, what was out in the Pacific. And they'd say, well, you know, and nobody else, no, very few people really knew at that time. And I think a lot, very few people know now what the Pacific was like. It's a huge, huge, huge place. And suffice to say that the Japanese at that time were absolute masters of the Pacific. Uh, they controlled the entire eastern coast of China. They had inroads into China, all of Manchuria, Borneo, uh, Sumatra, Singapore, Malaya, uh, the East Indies, the Philippines. They had even taken Atu and Tiskiska Islands in the Aleutians. People don't realize that. They were right on the doorstep of Alaska. People in the West Coast began to get kind of worried. <laughs> That's what we were faced with when we, we got there. <coughs> uh, the Japanese had control of everything except a very small portion of New Guinea, the southern, southwest portion of New Guinea. And the only reason they didn't have that was because the Australians were there. We weren't there. The Australians were there, and they were holding on by grim death. And uh, that's when things started. Uh, the Allied, Allied offensive really began in about May of 1942. And uh, this began with the Battle of the Coral Sea. And the, the ships that in, were in that battle were Americans. But there were also Australian ships, British ships, and I believe it or not, Dutch ships. And I'll give you an idea of what kind of a model we had. 
And the Battle of Coral Sea was started because the Japanese had, start, had, be, had formed a big invasion force to attack the southern end, the southwestern end of, of Australia at Port Borsby, where the Australians were holding out by the skin of their teeth with the intent of, of knocking the whole damn island off and taking over the entire Pacific completely. And then their next step was Australia itself. They beat, they didn't beat the Japanese. We, uh, we, didn't, we didn't win that battle, the Battle of Coral Sea, but we did do one thing. We changed the Japanese's mind and they decided not to invade Port Moresby. They pulled back and we lost the Lexington, which was one of our big carriers. The Yorktown was very badly damaged and had to go back to Pearl for repatriation. But they turned the Japs away. That was the first time the Japs had ever been turned away from anything. And they sat and, and uh, sat and thought a little bit. The Admiral Fee had, had second thoughts. And there's another thing about this that's really important. Most people don't realize this. The American intelligence group had broken the Japanese naval code. And we knew, the Americans knew, what they were going to do before they did it. Because they got every message and they, trans they, they transcribed it and they had the, we had it in our hands. The other thing that most people don't realize, this was the infancy of radar. And radar was beginning to become a real tool. We could see the Japanese before they could see us. We knew where they were before they could see us. And these two things made a tremendous difference in what was going to happen in the, in the Pacific. The other thing I want to bring up here before we go on is, is uh, we owe, we, the ground troops, owe a great deal. Most of us probably owe our lives to the Navy. Unlike the, 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 the European theater, you didn't do anything in the Pacific unless you had control of the ocean. You had to have, you had to have a way to put somebody on an island. They were all islands. And if you didn't have a way to control the ocean and you didn't have a way of supply, you weren't going to go anywhere. And this is why the Japanese had done so well. They controlled the, the water. So we began, uh, be, began working on the Japanese. And after, after the uh, Battle of uh, Pearl Sea, uh, we had uh, several others. Probably the most important one was in June of 1942, when the Battle of Midway. And by historians, this is probably the most important naval battle in, in, the, in the Pacific. We destroyed four of major Japanese carriers and a, a lots of other surface vessels. But the thing that was most important was that we destroyed their airplanes, their naval air arm, and more important than that, we destroyed their pilot force. All their experienced pilots were lost in the Battle of Midway. And from then on, they had second-rate pilots flying their planes. They couldn't trade them. We, we traded them up. And that's where our air began to take over. And, and the Japanese, the, the top people in the Japanese Admiralty knew that they were in deep, deep trouble. And uh, we had money, many more, but those were, that was the, one of the most important ones. And they had a battle of the Philippine Sea later on, a battle of Lady Gulf, when the Japanese Navy was absolutely, totally destroyed. But I think it's important to, to, uh, to give credit where credit is due. And without the Navy, there would have been no landings anyways. <coughs> Let me just go back to the land war here a little bit. Uh, we landed in New Guinea. And we were told that when we landed there, we were going to re be replacements for the 112th Regimental Combat Team and that we were going to be assigned to the 32nd Division as this, uh, to work with them on what they called the Dranamore River. And uh, somewhere, I think we've got to start getting some pictures. George, can we get the uh, lights on the front end here? <coughs> uh, this is a an overview of the uh, Pacific, uh, the western uh, 
the eastern part of the Western Pacific showing uh, New Guinea. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, uh, this is part of the, this is New Ireland, this is New Britain. Uh, this is uh, Guadalcanal, uh, no, not Guadalcanal. Uh, uh, this is Guadalcanal here. This is the Bougainville. And this is the Solomon Islands. Down here is the tip of Australia. And uh, Port Moresby is right in here. And the Japanese had them driven back to within 30 miles of the, of the coast. And uh, it was 300 miles from here to, to the invasion of uh, Australia. George, you want to have another <coughs> slide? Sure. This picture shows how much of the island of New Guinea the Japanese had occupied. They'd, they'd occupied the whole eastern part, which is where, where most of the, the civilization was. This is jungle. This is jungle. And this line back through here is the Owen Stanley Mountains. And uh, people don't realize this. Uh, New Guinea is the second largest island in the world. It has mountains on it that are over 15,000 feet high. It's on the, the northern end of New Guinea, which you can't see, is off the map up here, is on the equator. <coughs> so in all intents and purposes, the entire island is, is on the equator. You have temperatures that are one, well in excess of 100 degrees. It rains every day. And the rain is something you've never seen or heard before, unless you've been there. You can hear the rain coming a mile away in the jungle. And it sounds like a freight train. A steady roar. And when it gets there, you're drenched. And it never dries out. There's nothing but mud. Um, this, uh, these two things here are important, only in that this is the first landing of the 112th Regimental Combat Team on the island of Woodlark in 1943, and then this is the second landing on Alway, New Britain, where they landed with the Marines near Cape Gloucester to try and put a cap on the major Japanese naval station in Rabaul. This is where they supplied all their people coming down here, down what they call the slot, to uh, Guadalcanal. And the battles in here, there were seven battles, seven, seven um, naval battles in here off Sable Island. And there were so many ships sunk in here that it was called Iron Bottom Sound. And uh, it was a, but by doing this and beginning to get our forces aligned in here, we affected, and taking over the, the sea with our own navy, we effectively put the Rabaul out of, out of commission. And this was a major naval base. The next one was nearest was, was Truck, which was way up near the, Iwo Jima. Okay, we landed there and uh, we came ashore in Higgins boats. I don't know whether you know what a Higgins boat is, but these things didn't have any drop fronts or anything. These were the old original Higgins boat. You were unloaded by climbing down uh, rope, rope ladders onto the Higgins boats and they came in and browned themselves and you climbed over the side up to here in water and walk to shore. Now, we were not, uh, George, let's try the next, next uh, slide here. <coughs> we landed in a place they call Itapi. And I find it here in a minute. Can you focus that a little more, George? There we are. This is Itapi right here. And we were uh, to, re we joined the 32nd Division and formed a defense line here along what they call the, the uh, Dorinamore River. And uh, there was a little town here called Afua, right here, which this is the Dorinamore River, it's down here, Father. And it was the Afua, even though the line, the, the notice is here, is about eight, was about eight miles inland on along the river. And we were posted uh, there uh, with the 32nd Division. And one thing interesting <laughs> I have to say about our landing. We landed at dark as usual, black as the ace of spades. <coughs> we were, I don't know, I think probably about 50 of us in this group. The whole boat unloaded because of the reinforcements for the 32nd Division or anything else, but the group that we were with 
There were about, I don't know, 50, I'd say. And it was too dark for them to read anybody's names. So they lined us up in a line. And the sergeant said, said uh, uh, you guys are going to go to the 112th Cavalry, and you guys are going to go to the 148th Field Artillery. Well, I had been changed in the art, turned trained in the artillery, so I figured, you know, I, I wound up in the 112th Cavalry side <laughs> and suddenly found out that I was now an infantryman. I didn't know the first thing about it, but that, that's the way it worked. I said, boy, this is, this is something else, the way the Army trains us all to be specialists and it's dark and they can't read your name, so you wind up wherever they want to put you. Uh, so we, uh, <coughs> we were there for a couple of days, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little more about that in a minute. The uh, 112th Cavalry uh, was, a, a, was a regimental combat team with a battalion of field artillery. They began their, uh, or at least as far back as I could go to trace them, in the 30s, they were stationed at Fort Bliss, Texas, uh, 1,500 men, 1,500 horses, and they were patrolling the Rio Grande River from Sanderson to El, El, El Rigo. Uh, and uh, just about 100 miles. Uh, they were providing uh, security for the Southern Pacific Railroad and also performing all the border patrol duties that they would normally have. They were one of two remaining fully mounted cavalry troops uh, uh, cavalry regiments in, in the in the army. And uh, as things began to get bad in the in the Pacific, uh, my understanding that at one time when Roosevelt and and Churchill were talking to each other, uh, it was recognized that most of the Australian and New Zealand troops were in Africa fighting Rommel, and there weren't that many people on Australia to take care of it. Here's here are the Japanese knocking on their back door. So they decided that one of the things they could do would be to put a surveillance team on the north coast of Australia. And what could be better suited for that horrible part of the world than a cavalry troop on horses? There were no roads, nothing. So all of a sudden, the cavalry troop were, were, were mounted, uh, taken and put on troop ships, left their horses behind, and went to New Caledonia where they got 1,500 unbroken wild Mustangs from Australia, which they had to start to train all over again. And while they were doing that, they were uh, guarding the island of New Caledonia from uh, the, what they call the Nomia Valley. Then they were shipped to, suddenly shipped to Townsville, Australia, left their horses, made them leave their horses in New Caledonia, and they joined General MacArthur's 6th Army and were told that they were now infantry ground troop and that they were going to be a special combat assault team. And uh, so all of a sudden they wind up being infantry. And here's a bunch of tough old cavalrymen. This was, this was tough going. And it wasn't very long after that that they made their first landing, the first American Army landing, 6th Army landing, on Woodlark Island, which is halfway between New Guinea and uh, and Guadalcanal, and uh, this was the beginning of the beginning of the American Army offensive in the Pacific. And uh, they were very fortunate in the Japanese. Several months before they made the landing, had elected to take uh, their almost their entire garrison from Woodlark Island and send it to to Guadalcanal, where they were working on building this big airstrip, which they were intended to use for their bombers to bomb mm -hmm. Australia. So the landing was relatively unopposed, and uh, they were very fortunate in that. Uh, from there, they were then sent to uh, what I told you before was uh, Arroway, New Britain. And uh, there they had, they made a, a, a very, very well and a famous landing. It was called the Rubber Boat Landing. They made three landings by rubber boat on the coast of uh, New Britain. Uh, two of them were relatively easy. The third was an absolute bloodbath. They, uh, I don't know how many, how many guys were killed, but they, they had, by the time they left that island, they were almost 50% casualties. And they were helped by, the, they, they sent in the 158th Regimental Combat Team and a battalion of uh, Marine um, artillery, tanks, excuse me, tanks. 
And uh, they joined up finally with the Marines who were on the other side of the island at Cape Gloucester, finally took, took this, the south end of, of New Britain and neutralized Rabaul. And then from there they went back to Finchhaven and refitted and got some replacements and uh, were then sent to assault on our friends here, Itapi, New Guinea. So that's the history of the 112th up until now. I'll tell you more about them later on. But we were told to sit down and I said, there's a big pile of bags over there. Go over and sit down on it. Said, Stay there until it gets daylight and we'll, we'll work out something for you. And so we did. We went over and sat out and sat down on this big pile of bags. We got daylight and we found out these were all mail bags with mail in it for the troops. Up on the on, up in the mountains and on the up the hill, and they couldn't deliver them. There's no way these guys hadn't gotten any mail from Lord knows when, and they were all soaked with rain. And everything is unbelievable. George, can we have another uh, picture here? This will show you uh, <coughs> where we were. This was an airstrip that had been taken, Taji airstrip, and it had been put back in operation, and American planes were now flying out of it. Can you make that a little clearer, John? That's pretty good. These were the uh, combat teams and regiments of the 32nd Division. And this was their reserve. Another one here. We're way up here. We're up here in At At Afua. Uh, and as I say, this is about eight, eight and a half miles. 112th, and our job was to keep the Japanese from going around us. That right here was the mount, there was the Torricelli Mountains, and Torricelli Mountains were very rugged, very steep. And uh, it was the expectation of the Jap 18th Army uh, that who were in Wewak down here, and they had been gradually driven up this way. That the expectation was that they were going to attack here. And this is why there were so many people and reserves all down here. Well, they fooled us all. They went here. And I'll tell you about that in a second. Uh, the following morning, after we had seen us sat on these uh, wet uh, bags, this guy, a sergeant, came up to us and he says, I want you guys for detail. The people you're going to be with aren't going to be here for a couple of days. And they're going to be sending a, a, a combat team down. And they're going to pick up uh, rations and, for, and food and ammunition. And you're going to go back with them. But he says, I need you now. So he says, come with me. So we started up a path on the back side of this activity. Somewhere in here. Was a, there was another river in here known as River X. And there was a path along it. And it was pretty quiet. It was no, but they'd had um, a, a troop up in this area here who had been ambushed by the Japs and had a number of casualties. And he said, we're going to go up and bring back some of our own guys back. And uh, we didn't, you know, didn't mean anything to us. So he says, now when we get there, he said, I have to bury these guys in their holes. And uh, we've left their foot out. And he says, if you see a foot with a jungle boot on it, it's one of our guys. He said, we've got to dig them up and bring them back. So up we go. Mud up to, up to your eyebrows. Rain. <coughs> so we get this place that's obviously been all fought over with shell fire and fragments and so forth. And here they are, guy's foot sticking up out here, another one over here. These guys have been buried for about a week and uh, uh, wrapped up in their ponchos, but uh, still, we have to dig them up. And uh, we, ra we cut the uh, bamboo poles, big bamboo poles, and we wired their bodies onto the bamboo poles with telephone wire. And it took six of us to carry a body down give you an idea what the terrain was like. And uh, we did this for the better part of two days. And I think in total we brought about eight bodies back and gave them grade registration. But that was my introduction into the 112th Regimental Combat Team. And as a young, young kid, about 18 years old, it was quite an eye-opener to, to what the world was all about. <coughs> the Japs had the 18th Army here. And the Japanese 18th Army was the top, ar top military fighting group of the Japanese Army. They are the guys who took China, took Manchuria. They were the ones who were responsible for the rape of Nanking, which I'm sure most of you have heard about. 
And they were a bunch of tough nuts, believe me. They were probably the best jungle fighters in the world, the Japanese were, without any question. And uh, this was a big operation. They, were, they had their supplies cut off, and they were gradually starving to death. And they were making a last desperate effort to move past us and get up to Hollandia where they would get some more supplies. Hollandia's off the map up here. <coughs> so instead of attacking where everybody thought, they attacked down here. They patrol came down and got me and some other guys, and we came back up this same trail. We came all the way up the back side here. And the Japs had already started their assault on this area. And uh, our people had established uh, positions on this side of the river. And uh, the Japs drove the outfit off those positions three times. They had to wade back across the river and establish new places here. And the reason they had to do this is because Japs were trying to flank them. So they had to put new protection down here. So they pulled back. That happened three times. The third time, I, got, I was there. And uh, it was a bloodbath. We had prepared positions here. All they, all they did was retreat to them, and there they were. They'd already been dug. The Japs, to attack us, had to cross that river, wade across that river. And we had a big open field of fire. And in the two weeks I was there, we killed 2,000 Japanese. You can see the blood running down the damn river. Uh, George, let's go on to a couple more pictures, because I want the people here to see what this place was like. Now, this is the, what they call the Kokoda Trail. And I don't know whether you can see this clearly or not. Can you focus a little bit, George? Yeah, that's it. This was the famous trail that went up the backbone of the Owen Stanley Mountains, began down near Port Moresby and went up, and it was the trail that the Japanese came all the way down on when they took most of the island. And there's the trail they had to go back up most of the way when they were retreating. That's an Aussie. And there's another one over there. And these guys saved our bacon. You can say what you want about how great we all were, but the Australians were there long before we were, and they took a hell of a beating. But they held out. And uh, we finally put uh, the 32nd Division, which, which we were assigned to, had originally been flown in to Port Moresby to help the Australians start pushing the Japanese back up the Kokoda Trail, and then they were brought back and put up on the... But this was a... This is, gives you an idea of the mountains up here. Now, this is the top of these mountains, and uh, you can see there's not a hell of a lot of foliage, but boy, you start going down below this, and you'll see in the next picture... George, let's have the next one. <laughs> this is called a road in New Guinea. Uh, the only thing that could, could function on these things in the... Along the coastal area were things like jeeps, and when the, and, and the road got better, they could get ten, ten wheelers and so forth. But this was the only road. This was the only road, and the thing that's interesting here about the, the, the jungle, these guys are hauling two big barrels of fresh water that have been chemically purified. You couldn't drink any water from a, from a stream or anything else. These things were so full of them bad stuff. Jung you get jungle, you put this on a, an open sore and you start getting jungle rot right away. So they had to put these barrels around in places where sometimes you could go down and get a canteen and then you had to put stuff in it. Nobody took a bath, believe me. But this is a good example of what the roads were like. Now let's see a couple more, George. This is a good example of what the jungle was like where you were going through it. A guy could be from here to that chair from you. You wouldn't know you were there. There's about 15 guys here. I don't know whether you can see them, but that's, that's the kind of stuff you have to go through. Uh, next one, George. This will give you an idea of what had to be done in order to, for porters, and here's one of them here carrying stuff, to get up some of these ridges and mountains in the mud. They had to, the engineers had to put steps in like this so that you could climb the darn things. You went, if anything that went up there, you carried on your back, or you had pack animals. George, the next slide probably is a good one, too. <coughs> this shows, probably better than anything, these were some of the best trails. This is an Australian pack group coming down the mountain, and this is a field gun. 
The barrel has been taken off the field gun, and if you'll notice this, the big tree stump and all the ropes, they had a block and tackle on this thing, and they're pulling it up the side of the mountain so they can get the artillery into a position where it's close enough to fire on the enemy. That's what they had to do. And it was, uh, we had to do the same thing. We had uh, uh, 75 millimeter pack howitzers uh, when I first got there, but after that I didn't see them anymore. They had been able to pull our artillery, we had 105 millimeters, up to within about four miles of us, and uh, that was well within the range of the, of the artillery. So we did have artillery cover, and we had uh, all the mortars we could use, but we were short on, short on ammunition, short on, on f when they started this, this drive with the Japs, they had to go to air supply. George, the uh, next slide may show that. No, I'm sorry, this is, this is another typical example of the kind of places, now there's another guy right here, you didn't see him, there's another one right here firing a BAR automatic rifle. But this is the kind of cover you were in all the time. Uh, George again, this is the airdrop. Uh, for 45 days, we were supplied by air from the Taji Airdrome on the, at, right near uh, Itapi. <clears throat> These are C-47s, the old, uh, the military version of the DC-3. <clears throat> they flew all this. We had an area, an area cleared along one edge of the river, and uh, they would try and drop these things down on, the, on that area. And uh, they were most, a lot of it was uh, parachute, hooked, hooked to parachutes. Uh, we had one fellow that was right next to us in 128. One of these things dropped on him and killed him right there in his hole. Uh, when the, at the height of this, uh, they were dropping up to 43, 44 tons of supplies a day. Thus, everything we got, shoes, socks, you name it, it came by air. For 45 days, they supplied us by air. So that'll give you an idea of what, the, what New Guinea was like. It had, you know, malaria, dengue fever, dysentery, uh, jungle rot, leeches, and mud, 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 and rain, rain, rain. That was what it was like. And uh, there wasn't any place you could sleep where it was dry. There was no dry place to sleep. We used to, carry an extra, we used to carry an extra pair of socks in our waist, tucked in our waist between our under shorts and our belt to try and keep a pair of socks dry so you could put them on your feet once in a while to keep dry feet. I got jungle rot back there how many years ago, and I still got it. There's no way you can get rid of it. You can control it, but you can't get rid of it. Okay, let's go on here a little bit. <coughs> I've going through the 112th. These people were, were referred to by the press as the little giant of the Pacific. And uh, I was very proud by the end of the war to have been associated with them. They were a uh, super, super bunch of guys. Most of them that I met when I came in as a replacement were uh, regular army. They were not draftees. They were regular army people. And thank you, George. Don, thank you. Um, They were a bunch of tough guys. Most of them were native, native Texans, and we had quite a few uh, Mexican Americans. Martinez, Rodriguez, Gomez, all of them, super, super guys, real great people. Um, in the course of their, of their activity in the Pacific, uh, we were awarded two medals of honor. Uh, Two presidential union citations, uh, 56 silver stars, two legions of merit, 111 bronze stars, six air medals, and 1,200 purple hearts. And this is for an outfit that has 1,500 men in it. To give you an idea of what kind of an outfit it was. They had the second longest tenure in battle of any outfit in the Pacific except for the 32nd Division. 
We had 12,000 hours of combat. That's over 450 days. Continuous battle. And uh, they, were, they were a fine bunch of guys to be with. <coughs> we were relieved by uh, one of the, I think it was the 126th Regimental Combat Team in New Guinea. We came back and uh, refitted. Uh, we're given uh, new, new clothes. I got a brand new Thompson submachine gun, which I learned how to fire fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. I'd had a carbine up until then, and then they'd given me a, what they call a grease gun, which was a, was a uh, rising submachine gun. It was one of these things made out of stamped metal, and it was actually designed for airborne people. It had a telescoping metal um, um, stock on it. And uh, it wasn't worth a damn, but the Thompson was a great gun. <coughs> so we were put on, put on uh, troop transports uh, and uh, LCIs. These are landing craft, what they call landing craft infantry. These are big ships that have a big front that opens up and a gate that comes down. And took off and, uh, in uh, October of 1944 and landed on Lady. And uh, George, you want to show us the next slide here, please? This is the island of Lady in the Philippines. We landed right here. Now, this, this was a humongous, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, convoy um, that, uh, that, that took off for, uh, for, for Lady. The Japanese did everything they could possibly do uh, to interrupt that invasion. But they made some mistakes and they pulled out and by the grace of God we did not get, have any of our transports attacked. They pulled off and got out of there. When we landed there, the, we would had a heavy uh, a naval bombardment and air bombardment of the shore when this big airstrip was in here in the town of Taklovan. The Japanese, not knowing what was happening but suspecting the worst, had pulled back so that they were back here, waiting for reinforcements to come to them from Ormoc. This was their head main supply area. So we went in landing and were almost unopposed. And this will give you an idea of how big an operation was. In 24 hours, they landed 32,000 of us with all our equipment and everything else on that beach. And that takes a lot of boats, let me tell you. We were then assigned to the 1st Cavalry Division, which we stayed assigned to for the rest of the war. And our job was to start down here and start down this way and pick up what, what eventually turned into the Ormoc Road and work our way towards Ormoc, which was the center of all the Japanese activity. This is where they got their supplies coming around through here and into Ormoc. <coughs> to give you an idea, of, again, of what the Navy did for us, one Japanese convoy came down there, down here. They were intercepted by our Navy people, and out of that convoy, they sank four Japanese destroyers and one minesweeper and five troop carriers. They sunk those troop carriers, and they drowned 10,000 Japanese soldiers. That'll give you an idea how safe, how much they helped us. That's all we needed was 10,000 more Japs on that island. <coughs> we got to Ormoc and started up along the, the mountains here. And this was a very rugged area. And the mud and everything was unbelievable. The road was almost impassable. There's one part of the road in here uh, where they, it was so, so bad they had to transfer the cargo uh, from uh, ten, 10 wheelers to uh, ducks, amphibious ducks. Short, uh, run them across this mucky place, then reload them back into ten wheelers. And the army finally, and the engineers finally got it boarded up so that we could actually get trucks up that, that thing in the Ormoc. That was the first time we'd ever seen trucks. But it was a mess. And uh, as luck would have it, I came down with my first attack of malaria as we reached Ormoc, and was fortunate in that I missed uh, some really tough, tough going in the uh, what they call Loney and uh, Tanagua. And I was sent back to a field hospital for 10 days with, 
with malaria. And uh, we ca I came back, I was there for about a week. Then we were relieved and brought back to, uh, to Tackleton. And uh, we were there for about a week and a half, two weeks. And we were loaded on uh, transports and were ready for the invasion of Luzon. Um, one thing about my radio operating work, um, up until now, and up until about now, I had been a single, uh, an operator with a walkie-talkie. And uh, the walkie-talkies were, if you could yell lots of times, your voice would carry about as far as the radio would. <coughs> and we were very fortunate when we were on New Guinea, and in parts of Lady here, that we had uh, wire, telephone wire communication by a field telephone. And we had a good group of of uh, uh, what do you call them, airplane spotters, Piper Cubs that were used as uh, observers for the artillery. And they could get down with their radio. You could talk to them up there and then they'd relay or call their stuff back to the artillery and we'd tell them what they wanted to do and they'd, they'd, they'd direct the artillery. But when we got to, to Lady, they, uh, it opened up the point where they could give us bigger radios. And the first thing we find out is we get big, bigger radios that take two guys to operate, one to operate the radio and one to sit on one of these grinders that grinded uh, generators. And uh, I got my first uh, Segundo with me, a fellow by the name of Casimir. And while I was in the field hospital, he got hit in the leg with a piece of shrapnel and he went to the hospital. <coughs> and uh, so from then on, I always had, I was ha a second guy with me. and. Uh, when we got to uh, Luzon, I'll tell you more about that. But uh, Lady was a, uh, ladies, the Lady campaign didn't last that long. It was only about two and a half months. But uh, we pretty well wiped out the whole island. There weren't many people left. <coughs> George, how about the next slide here? This just give you an idea. This is a, what they call an LCI, and this is the front of it. It's on the beach. Pardon? It's an LSC. All right. Well, I don't care. But this is what we had anyway. <laughs> and uh, and uh, the, the front doors opened. I'm, I'm sorry, LST. Of course you were. And uh, the ramp would come down, and you could get uh, tanks and troops and field guns and trucks and everything else off it. And this was one of the ones that landed in uh, on in uh, Tacloban. And uh, the next slide, I'll slow you to something else. You want to go again, George? This is here for purpose. When we landed, the sand on the beach was like that. You could see it. It was granular, blowing in the wind, and everything else. A week after we got there, we got our first typhoon. And that was the opening of the rainy season. And from then on, it was just like New Guinea. You were up there, you are behind in mud, and rained every day, and so forth. But I use that only to show you how quick the quick can change. In these parts of, of Luzon and, and Leyte in the, in the Philippines, they have a wet and a dry season. In the dry season, it's fine, dust. In the rainy season, it rains every day. In New Guinea, it rains all the time. Okay, George, go ahead. This is just an example of, this is, happens to be a marine group uh, on uh, <coughs> New Britain. But it's very typical of the area and the, and the type of uh, trenches and emplacements and so forth that we had to use on the Drenamore River. And uh, we had a river out in front of us, and when the Japs had to come across, you had a tremendous field of fire, and you could really blow them away. But it was a, you were in mud. You were sitting, standing in mud all the time. Okay, now how about the next one, George? I'm not sure where we are. Okay. We left, uh, we left Luzon, uh, still attached to the 1st Cavalry Division. You left uh, pardon? You left Leyte. I said, we, I should, we left Leyte for Luzon, and we uh, landed up here in Lingai and Gulf. Can you cr do that a little brighter, George, a little clearer? There you go. <laughs> With the 1st Cavalry Division. And we came down two roads, this road and this road, and then down in here to Manila. 
And uh, the 1st Cavalry Division was the first, first division into Manila. Our job was to guard their left flank all the way down. So this is mountainous up and through here for a period, a distance of almost 100 miles. And this is a regiment. And we had jeeps and we had patrols out. We had combat patrols, 12, 14 combat patrols out all the time along this road. Uh, the Japanese, uh, roughly from, from here, north, to the end of, of, of the island, had about 130,000 troops. From here down, they had about 110, but they had a garrison of 20,000 men in Manila. So it was about even Stephen, but they had a lot of men. And they did very typically what they always do. Uh, when we landed in force there, the first thing they did is start to pull back in the mountains and out of the way. And they didn't contest us until we got right in, into uh, Manila. <coughs> I did not go into Manila directly. I was out here somewhere up in this area on one of these, uh, as a radio operator on one of these patrols. Um, but some of the 12th Cavalry, the 1st uh, Cavalry did, and I think the next pictures will show We'll have to back up to this a little bit, George, but if you can show just the next couple of pictures, then we can back up to this. This is a very typical picture of what we encountered as we were going into Manila. Uh, I was on the outskirts of it, but going in, it got worse and worse. Uh, the battle in Manila was a door-to-door, room-to-room fight. The entire garrison of 20,000 men, Japanese, were killed in Manila. They did not give up. Not, not a single one of them surrendered. We had to kill every darn one of them. <coughs> Go ahead, George. This is another picture of the devastation in some of the areas on the outskirts of the city, but it was a mess. It was really, a, really a dirty mess. And we were very fortunate. This was the dry season. There was no rain. And you could, you could get trucks on the road, you get jeeps on the roads. And this is the first time that it happened to us. <coughs> okay, George, you want to pull back to the big, no, not that one, go the other way. <coughs> Just back it up, George. One more. Okay. When we were through down here in Manila, we for some, for some strange reason were all of a sudden taken en masse and sent to Baguio which is way up here, as a part of the, once again, the 32nd Division. They were fighting up in this area, and they were having a real tough time. Baguio is the summer capital of Luzon. And when things got really hot down here in the summertime in Manila, all the government aid people and everything would move up to Baguio, which was the summer capital, and it was a lot cooler and nicer and the higher ground. And the Japanese put up a pretty tough fight there. We were there for about two weeks, and uh, through the form, I came down with yellow jaundice and malaria for the second time. I went to field hospital for another 10 days. And this was not uncommon. Uh, half the guys that were out of action were sick, not wounded, sick with some kind of a bug, malaria, you name it. Uh, I got hit in the arm by, by uh, shrapnel. Here, little piece like a razor blade, no bigger than a razor blade, right here. And I got hit right here in the wrist, no bigger than a, it was, I think it was a stone because it didn't stick into me. And uh, I got hit once more under the arm here with a piece of shrapnel about that big around. And it went in just, it was spent shrapnel, went in just deep enough so I, I could still reach it with my hand. I pulled it out, put some, uh, put some uh, sulfur on it and I was very lucky. Uh, after Baguio, we came back down here to a place called Santa Maria. Now this is Santa Maria is down in this area here and went up and toward the, see this little, this little lake right here. There's a road that comes up to this and this was an Ipo Dam was right in here and this was a big freshwater lake which was actually part of the water supply for Manila. And the Japanese had, had uh, gone in there and they had dug these humongous caves. These caves were big enough to put field artillery in. They'd roll the artillery out, fire the gun, and roll it back into the cave. It was almost impossible to get them. 
And there was a place up there called Norzigarai, and this was on the road. And we were supposed to keep that road open. We were told this is the, you've got to keep that road open. And you went up this road, it was about eight miles from Santa Maria, and you went into this big valley. It's a great big round valley, about three miles across. And I'll tell you what it looked like. It looked like an extinct volcano. Just a great big round mountain around all the way on the side of it. And in the center is this little hill. And all around it, it was, was, was open fields. And this had been a big sugar, sugar plantation. And in this, on this little hill had been stone buildings that had been built. And these were the, were the, were the barracks for the, for the employees on the sugar plantation where they housed them. And it was where the office was, and the overseers lived there, and they kept their machinery there and everything, right in this road, right at the center where the road crossed. <coughs> so when we came out, the Japs pulled back, got out of there. They weren't, they weren't in a position to, to uh, protect it. And so we established ourselves there. And this, uh, this uh, place got, its, got the name in the, in the, in the, in the logs of the records that we kept of the division in the, in the, in the uh, regiment as known as Hot Corner. Uh, to those of us who were there, it was known as Coffin Corner. We lost almost half our men there. This was something. They would pull, they pulled a Banzai attack on us every night. They would shell us at, at the sun was going down and shell until it got dark. And they'd come up out of this thing yelling and hollering, screaming with bayonets. And, Boy, we had, we had one hell of a time. And uh, I have a, I had a, a fellow by the name of uh, Shelton, who was my cranker, and a fairly new guy. And we had, we were sharing a big hole together with this monstrous radio. And uh, it was very quiet. And he was tired of sitting in the hole. He said, I can't sleep in the hole anymore. I'm going to get up and lie on top of the hole. Well, I said, don't you do it. Don't you dare do it. I said, it's dangerous. Ah. So he gets up there, lies down right next to me on top of the hole. And sure enough, they cut, cut loose the machine gun. And they hit him right in the ear. Killed him just like that. He never even knew what hit him. And I reached up, and I knew I could see blood coming out of his so I pulled him down the hole, and, but he was dead. So he sat in the hole with me that night, dead. And the next day, they, they took him away and sent out another guy by the name of Irving. And this guy was a piece of work. Uh, he had been in the, in the uh, parachutes, parachute people at Fort Bragg. And I don't know whether you, any of you know what the parachute people did in those days, but. When they were in the barracks and they were blue reveille, the guys who were on the second floor of the barracks, they didn't come down the stairs. They opened the window and jumped out. That was gung-ho stuff. You were a paratrooper, that's what you did. Well, Irving jumps out and breaks his ankle in about eight places. <laughs> so they send him to the hospital and patch him all back up, and he comes back, and they said, oh, you can't, you can't jump with a leg like that. So they transferred him to the infantry. <laughs> And I get him as a replacement. And this guy was really something else. And so at that point, the day he came out, we decided to move our, our, our whole defense system up higher on this little mound up near this big uh, uh, stone building on the top of the hill. And uh, Go ahead, you're all right. uh, I, told, I told Irving, I said, now look, you, dry, you dig in the, 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 the organ grinder, the, the generator, and I'll dig in the radio. Okay. So I'm working like a beaver digging this hole in, because I knew we were going to get it for if, within a couple of hours. <coughs> and I look over, <coughs> and Irvin's sitting there in a little hole that's about this big around and about this deep. And I said, boy, you got to get moving. He says, I can't. I'm sick. I'm sick. I said, well, what's the matter? And he says, well, I think I had too many peanuts to eat. And I said, peanuts? Yeah. He says, I'm going to go over and sit down under the tree. So there's this big tree going, growing up beside his stone wall building. He goes over and sits down under the tree. And I'm digging away, and I I'm put a board over the, I found an old door in the barn, like uh, in the building, and I put a board over the top of it and poured dirt on it. So I had a real, real cozy hole. <coughs> and all of a sudden, the Japs cut loose with what, what turned out to be a great big 
howitzer. And some of our guys had seen them pulling this thing up through the back of the woods in the jungle with, with uh, uh, water buffalo. We couldn't reach them. They were too far away for us to reach them with mortars. So they opened up with us, and the first shot, first shell, hits in the top of the tree where Irving is asleep. Now, I don't know what the odds are for something like that to happen, but this thing put a giant piece of shrapnel right through his elbow and right through his arm, sticking out both sides. And he runs over and jumps in his, his hole, quote unquote, and says, I'm hit, I'm hit, I'm hurt, hurt. I said, okay, I'll come over right after the next shell. So I jumped out of my hole and ran over to him. And he wasn't bleeding that bad, but I knew his artery had been cut because it was black, very black blood running out. So I put a tourniquet on him and I called for the, <coughs> the medics. And this fellow down the side of the hill was one of the guys that I knew, got to know a little bit. And I can't remember his last name. His name was Jim. And he said, I'm coming up. I said, wait till the next shell. So he comes up. I get out of my hole. He comes up and he's about six feet from the hole. And, he and the next shell comes and he makes a dive for the hole. And the shell goes off and he gets hit in about three places in the fatty. Not that bad, but he gets hit. But that guy, I'll tell you, he went into that hole, he put it in a better tourniquet. I had my belt on, on Irving's arm. He put another tourniquet on him. He got that guy out of that hole and dragged him with shrapnel in his behind, he dragged him down the hill into the shelter that they had on the back side of the hill for the wounded. And then the next day they took, uh, next morning they took him away and got him back to the field hospital. And, but that was a terrible place. We lost a lot of, a lot of good people there. You know, that's why it's got its name, Coffin Corner. <coughs> um, I'm trying to catch up here a little bit. We were then pulled back and went to uh, Ipo, uh, Ipo Dam. And we were there for a very short period of time, and we were trying to get the Japs out of these caves. And my, well, the only way we could do it is we got the, a tank destroyer group. I'd never seen a tank destroyer in my life until these guys came up, and they had this big, long barrel gun with a very flat, high-velocity, flat trajectory gun. And they could sit on the top of this hill and put these shells right in the Jap cave. And uh, they got some caves that way. Then they sent some pilots from a P-51 group up from Clark Field, these guys came up to see what we wanted to do. Half of them came up one day and half of them came up the next day. And we showed them from the top of the hill where we had to go. And they made notes and everything. These guys came back, went back, got in their P-51s and they had bombs on and napalm. And they skipped bomb these things into those caves. And that was beautiful. It was the damnest thing you ever saw in your life. But that's how we got them. And uh, they were great. <coughs> we went from there. Almost at the end here, folks. We went to the end down in this area here, which is called Antipolo and Tay Tay. And uh, we were working around what they call Laguna de Bay, right in here. And you see this peninsula here? Our job was to clear that peninsula out. And uh, this was very mountainous here. And our artillery was back here. And we could, the, the, the guys in the combat com patrols down on the, the point of the aisle couldn't get over the hill and to the artillery. So they take me and another guy and put us up on the top of a bare mountain between them. It was called Benchmark 25. Nothing, bare, just bare rock on top of it. They put us up there with two radios. One radio that we could talk to the combat patrol with and another radio that we could talk to the artillery with. And the, 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 uh, the Combat patrol would say, we need fire here, and so forth and so forth. And they'd give us the, the uh, coordinates. We'd radio that back to the artillery, and then they'd fire. So we were, we were relaying. It was a very important one. The point was, there was nobody else there with us. And I had two guys with me. One guy had just been sent overseas. And he was one of these hot shots. He had signed up to be trained in the Rangers. And they, he was with us, waiting to be called to be trained in the Rangers. Mm -hmm. And he was there with his... Thompson submachine gun. He says, boy, I want, to, I want to try that gun. I said, you shoot that gun, buddy, and I'll shoot you, you know. I said, the Japs don't know we're here. I said, don't skyline yourself. They don't know we're here. Uh, 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 so these two clowns would sit around and smoke and do all this other stuff. And 
So we were there for about three days. Two things. We were sitting on top of this hill and it was a beautiful clear morning. Beautiful clear morning. Down below in Laguna de Bay was this blackest big clouds you've ever seen in your life. Lightning coming out of them and everything else. And all of a sudden out of these things comes tornadoes. They come down and hit the water and make water spouts. There were three water spouts coming up out of the middle of that darn bay at one time. If I'd have had a camera, I'd have been on the front page of every, every magazine in the world. And here we are, and the sun is shining, and it's rain coming down, and there's uh, rainbows everywhere. It's the most beautiful sight you've ever seen in your life. You'll never see it again. The next morning, I'm sitting there doing the same thing, looking over this hill, and it's just getting daylight. And all of a sudden, this big swarm of bees comes up over the side of the hill. And I said to myself, being a farm boy, I said, bees don't fly around when there's dew on the ground. And so I crawl over to the edge of the hill and look down, and here's eight Japs coming up the damn hill with their bayonets fixed. And so I run over and grab these two clowns, and we pick up the two radios, and we run off. We had time, because they were down the hill. We had time. We ran off to the back side of the mountain and got down in the jungles and hid in the densest place I could find. And we just sat there. I said, Steer, quiet. Don't make a noise. Don't do anything. No smokes, no nothing. <coughs> and these guys, you can see them. They were up walking around looking at it. And they were where we were. They could see the damn hole. So they hunted for us for a day. And they came very close to us. But uh, they didn't get us. And so the following morning, we stayed there that whole night, that whole day and that whole night. We uh, found our way back to the artillery. And uh, the, guys, the guy at the artillery says, where you guys been? We needed you. I said, we got run off the mountain. He said, oh, well, come on and have something to eat. <laughs> and uh, that happened to be August 13th, when the Japanese surrendered. And uh, we were moved back to Antipolo. We were put on a big, uh, big uh, ship and sent to uh, Japan. We landed in Tokyo Bay. We were there the day ahead. And part of my unit was sent to uh, disarm a part of the a portion of the Emperor's Imperial Guard. The notes that you got are. I want to correct that. They said, we disarmed 70 units of the Japanese Imperial Guard. That's not 